So with this lesson, we're starting our fourth unit, which is called Solutions and Solubility. So we're going to learn more about um, what role water plays in making solutions, how solutions form on an atomic level, how to calculate concentration, how to do reactions involving solutions, um, and even some stoichiometry comes back here. Um, so that's kind of a little glimpse into what we're going to see with this unit. But we're going to start off with some background theory first on the importance of water. So what are some things we need to think about before we get started? We want to think back to a lot of things we learned about in our first unit on atomic structure. When we drew Lewis diagrams, so diagrams involving molecular compounds, we drew dipoles on the compounds, and that's where the electronegativity values and the electronegativity scale came in, and polarity. So all of those things are important to understand what we're going to do next. So if you need to do a quick review of that, you might want to pause and just read that over. But if you think you remember enough, then you should be set to go. So first thing we need to go over so we can understand a little bit more about water and its chemical properties are, is a term called a nonpolar compound. Nonpolar compounds are molecules, so we're talking about covalent compounds here, that have electrons that are evenly distributed around the atoms, meaning they have no overall charges. Think about the molecule being symmetrical. You can split it into two even parts. It can be in 2D or in 3D. When we think about dipoles, if there's any present, the dipoles will essentially cancel each other out or they'll be opposing each, each other. And so there'll be no charge left over. So to give you an idea of how this works, we're gonna look at a couple of examples. Let's start with a really easy one with something like oxygen. If we were to draw the Lewis diagram for oxygen, it would look something like this. And if we think back to the type of bond that's here, we might need to look at electronegativity. So the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.4 or 3.5, depending on your resource you're looking at. So here your change in electronegativity here is going to be zero. That means the electrons are shared evenly between the two atoms. This is a pure covalent bond. And because you have the same electronegativity value, you're not going to have a dipole. So no dipoles. So here, if we look at oxygen, the reason why it's considered a nonpolar compound is all of the electrons are evenly shared, there's no dipole, and you can even look at the molecule and see there's some symmetry. If you cut it in half, you've got two equal sides to it. So this is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, now let's look at a, another example that's a little bit different. What if we looked at carbon dioxide? It's also nonpolar, but there's a little bit more going on. So if we were to draw out its Lewis structure, it would look something like this. Here, if we write on the electronegativity values, we've got oxygen again, which is about 3.4, 3.5. And we've got carbon, which is 2.6. So here we have some differences. Are we going to have dipoles? Definitely. And remember, we point the dipole towards the more electronegative atom. So it's pointing towards the oxygen here. But when we look at the molecule, you can see that the two dipoles are the same, but they're opposing one another. If we look at the molecule, there's some symmetry. If we were to cut it in half like that, both sides are the same. So here, even though there are dipoles present, here we've got dipoles that will cancel out. 
they're equal and opposite. So with equal and opposite, this also makes it a nonpolar molecule. So if you look at any of the other examples that are listed there, in some way, shape, or form, they'll either have no dipoles, or if they do have dipoles, they cancel out. So overall, there's some symmetry, everything's evenly distributed, and we call those nonpolar molecules. Now let's look at another example. What happens when you have polar compounds? Now with polar compounds, you're going to notice something different happening. These are molecules where there's an uneven distribution of electrons. So that means not symmetrical. You might even want to make a note about that, not symmetrical. So if they're not symmetrical, what that means is when you look at the electrons and how they're distributed, one end will lack some electrons and have a positive charge, and one end of the molecule will have a negative end at it where the electrons maybe congregate together a little bit more. Here, you're going to find there's dipoles and they do not cancel out. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here so you can you can get the idea. So we've got HCl, let's take a look at that one first. If we draw its Lewis diagram, it will look something like this. If we look at its electronegativity values, hydrogen is about 2.2 and chlorine is about 3.2. So definitely there's a dipole here. Here it's only one simple bond, so there's no way that the dipole can cancel out. Now what happens to the molecule, all the electrons are getting pulled towards the chlorine. This is a polar covalent bond, but all the electrons end up over here. This makes this end have a partial negative charge, and this end have a partial positive charge. And when you have these charges that don't cancel out, you get a polar molecule. And this will give you your polar molecule. Now, if we look at another example, what if we pick hydrogen sulfide? So if we were to draw hydrogen sulfide, it looks something like this. Here, if we write on our electronegativity again, hydrogen and sulfur, here we've got dipoles. Sulfur is more electronegative. And then we've got some lone pairs of electrons around the center. Now, if we look at this, you might think at first glance that maybe these dipoles cancel, but this isn't the actual shape of hydrogen sulfide. We looked a little bit at molecules. Hydrogen sulfide is actually a bent molecule. The bonds are on an angle. And if we draw it in more of a proper format, this is its actual shape. So the dipoles actually come up on an angle like this. So these two don't actually cancel each other out. They're actually additive. This one goes towards the center. This one goes towards the center. And they could make one that kind of points up and away. Plus, you've got a couple of pairs of electrons. And there's nothing to cancel them out. They're negatively charged. So what ends up happening here is you get a buildup of negative charge around the sulfur and around the hydrogens, you get a buildup of positive charge. So here, the dipoles and the charges don't cancel out. 
And this will give you polar molecule. So now that we know a little bit about the difference between nonpolar and polar molecule, we can look at water and what kind of role it plays in making solutions. So let's talk a little bit more about water and some of its properties. So now that we know the difference between polar and nonpolar, water is a polar molecule because it has polar covalent bonds and it also has to do with its shape. So let's draw out water in its proper form. In a proper format, it also has a bent shape. Same kind of shape as what we just saw with the hydrogen sulfide. Now, if we write on the electronegativity values for reference here, we can see that there's a quite a big difference between hydrogen and oxygen and the dipoles point all towards the oxygen. So the electrons are being pulled more towards the oxygen on both sides. Plus the oxygen has two pairs of electrons here, making all of that area around the oxygen very negative. It has a partial negative charge and then the ends where the hydrogens are will have a partial positive charge. Now, knowing this, when we look at multiple water molecules coming together and interacting, what happens is their dipoles actually are attracted to one another. And this is caused by something called an intermolecular force. Now, what that means is it's an attraction between different molecules. They can be between different molecules of the same compound or between different molecules of different compounds. In the specific case with water, we call this intermolecular force hydrogen bonding. So what would this look like? So imagine we've got a couple of water molecules close to one another. There's one, then you've got a sample of water. So you're going to have, remember, thousands and thousands of water molecules in all sorts of arrangements here. We'll do one more over here. And you'll have to bear with me with my artistic abilities here, but I think we'll get the point. All right. And remember, when we are looking at charges around the oxygen you've got a partial negative charge and around the hydrogens you've got partial positive charges so why are we going to draw all these in this is going to show the formation of the hydrogen bonding that intermolecular force so let's label all of those and i keep making lots of mistakes here All right, so now we've got all of those in. We see a whole bunch of negative charges and positive charges. So what happens when we have negative and positive close together? They attract one another. So oxygen's negative. If it's close to a hydrogen on another molecule, you get an attraction. That's an intermolecular force between two molecules. Let's look at another spot this might happen. Negative, positive maybe these two will attract one another. These might be a little bit too far away, but maybe they have a little bit of an attraction here. And maybe this hydrogen's attracted to the oxygen and so on. So all of these lines that we've drawn in here, these are intermolecular intermolecular forces there's attraction between the molecules and this is specifically called hydrogen bonding hydrogen bonding 
doesn't just happen between hydrogen and oxygen. It can also be between hydrogen with oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen. Now, we're not going to focus so much on what happens with the other atoms here. There's more in grade 12 for that. But intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding is one. And with water, it's between hydrogen and oxygen. But it can happen with fluorine and nitrogen. Actually, before we go on, the other thing that's interesting to note, one of the properties of water that you might be familiar with is that when water turns into a solid, it's less dense than its liquid form. This is not normal for most compounds. The solid is more dense. But why that happens is it has to do with hydrogen bonding. You can see how the molecules are arranging themselves. There's a bit of a void in here or a gap. I'm just going to shade it in here in the yellow. This part in here, if we had a big, big sample of water, this would be like a mini air pocket. Now, if you can imagine you have millions and millions and millions and millions of water molecules in a sample, and all of a sudden you freeze it, you're going to have millions of these little tiny air pockets that form between the water molecules. And when you have air mixed in with the sample of water, when it freezes, it actually makes the water less dense and uh, when it's frozen into ice it'll float so it has to do directly with hydrogen bonding so in some of your reading you'll take a look at some of that now there are a few other things to talk about with intermolecular forces before we go on so intermolecular forces are really important for determining physical properties of matter so physical properties include things like boiling point, melting point, hardness, texture, state, anything like that. So the stronger the force, the higher the melting or boiling point, for example, or the harder the sample could be. There are other intermolecular forces. There are two that you will read about. One's called dipole-dipole and the other one's called London dispersion. Dipole-dipole forces happen between molecules that are polar, that have each their own dipoles. So this happens between polar molecules. We know polar molecules will have some kind of dipole left over. It doesn't cancel out, um, but it won't be uh, between hydrogen and oxygen or fluorine or nitrogen, it'll be between other atoms. London dispersion forces happen between all molecules. So both polar and nonpolar. And they're dependent on electrons. But more about this in grade 12. You can read a little bit about it in grade 11. But beyond just listing them, we're not going to talk any more about them going forward. So now that we know a little bit more about water, its properties, the hydrogen bonding, we're going to talk about what role it can play in the dissolving process. So before we get to actually talking about the process, we need to go over a couple of terms. One's called the solute and one's called the solvent. When you mix two things together to make a solution or you're dissolving, there's always two parts to it. The solute is going to be the substance in lesser quantity, so smaller amount. I put an example here of salt and water for these two terms. Think about putting some salt and mixing it in with water. So salt would be less than water for it to dissolve. The solvent is the substance in the greater quantity, the thing that does the mixing. A lot of solutions that you're familiar with have water as the solvent, but you can have solutions where other things are solvent, like oils when you're dealing with paint and other, other types of things. 
So, what happens when you try and dissolve ionic compounds? There's a couple of things we need to think about. One, ionic compounds are highly polar. Remember, they are made up of positive ions and negative ions. Here we have full positive and full negative charges. So very polar, we've got ionic charges here. Water we know is very polar because of its bent shape and because of the hydrogen bonds that form. So when you mix these two together, we have two very polar things. And what happens is the two ions in the ionic compound end up getting separated and they're attracted to different ends of the water molecule. Remember the ends of the water molecule are either positive or negative. So let's try and draw some of this out so you can get the idea. Let's say sodium chloride breaks apart our salt and we've got a sodium ion. Sodium is positively charged. Positively charged items like negatively charged things. So together mixed with water, the water that's there will come in and we know the end of the water molecule that's negative is around the oxygen. So the negative oxygen will be attracted to the positive sodium and the water molecules will orient themselves around that sodium to keep them separate from the other ions and keep them dissolved in solution. If you have the chloride ion, the opposite happens. It's negatively charged. It wants to attract the positive end of the water molecule. So what end is that? That's going to be the hydrogens. Remember, hydrogens have a partial positive charge. So you could have some water molecules on an angle here attracting, or in theory, you could have two hydrogens from the same water molecule. Let's make this look a little better there. Be attracted to the same chloride ion that's there. So when you mix polar water with these charged ions, different ends of the water molecule are attracted to the different ions depending on your charge, uh, depending on their charges. This process is called hydration. If you're reading about it, you're hydrating the ionic compound and it, and it allows it to stay dissolved in water. What happens now if you decide to mix some molecular compounds that have some polar characteristics this means part of the molecule might be polar and mixing it with water. This can still happen and it will form something called a miscible solution. This could happen between different alcohols and water. So if you think now, especially with hand sanitizers and disinfectants, they have different percentages of alcohols dissolved in water. So um, how do they do that? Well, it still comes down to some intermolecular forces. So if we look at the two structures here, this is ethanol, and you wouldn't be expected to draw this, this structure at this level, but it's given to you here. And this is your water. If you look again at water, we see those charges and we know it's polar. If we look at ethanol, ethanol on the very end has an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. Same type of charge distribution between oxygen and hydrogens. Oxygen is negative, hydrogen is positive. So when you have water molecules, you can have hydrogen bonds that could form between oxygen of the ethanol and hydrogen of the water or you could have the hydrogen of the ethanol be attracted to the oxygen of the water. Either one of those would work. But if a molecule has some positive and negative separation or polar character on one part, they can potentially still mix together. Now, very last situation, what happens if things don't mix well together? This is called emissible, unable to form a solution. So perfect example of this 
is oil and water. I'm sure you've observed this or if you're making salad dressing or something like that. The oil layer and the water layer are two separate layers. Why does this happen? The water molecules have hydrogen bonding down here, and this is a strong force. And this keeps the water molecules together. Up here, if we look at oil, oil is different. Oil is nonpolar. And remember what we said about nonpolar molecules, there's no charge separation. So there's no positive and no negative here. So the water molecules would rather be attracted to one another, negative and positive ends all over the place. Whereas up here, there's no charge. So all of these oil molecules up here will stay together in one state and the water down here, which is very polar, will stay in another in another layer. So this is polar, and this is nonpolar. So how do you know whether things will mix well together and not? There's an easy rule that we can follow for now, and it's called like dissolves like. So what does it mean? Solutes in similar polarity will dissolve in solvents of similar polarity. So if you have a polar solute, it will dissolve in a polar solvent. Or you could have nonpolar solute dissolving in a nonpolar solvent. But if you try and do something like oil and water, Polar and nonpolar substances don't mix and you'll get two layers that are there. So hopefully this lesson helps you understand a little bit more about water, some of its characteristics and how some of the dissolving process works. But I encourage you to read through your textbook. There's a lot more on these topics um, to give you a better understanding and some more examples and depth of knowledge of what's going on.